we are going to be back in Luke 15. We talked about two of Jesus' parables last week. And um, got to see kind of how Jesus was talking about these two objects, a sheep and a coin, and what people would do if they were missing, and, and how that represented both who we were in God's kingdom and how God responded. And what we learned is that we all are lost, but God is actively searching for us, wanting us, calling us to Him. And when we choose to respond to God's calling, heaven throws a party. And it's a very big deal. And I took my cookie now. Excuse me, one minute. And so Jesus is talking about how there's these inanimate objects, there's these sheep, and they hold these value. And not only is he talking about how we're seen in God's image, but he's also talking about how other people see the lost, the sinners, the outcasts, and how they value this sheep and this money more than they value the human life. And so Jesus is saying, hey, guess what? That's not, that's not God's kingdom, right? He's saying God values the person so much more than the sheep and the money and everything else that you put so much value on. And so God's wanting to call people back to heaven, call people back into his family, call people back into community who are going to be the ones that we don't really want in our community, who are kind of the outsiders of the Jewish culture, the people who we try not to associate with because what does that say about me? And so Jesus is saying that's not God's kingdom. God is saying, come, all who are lost, all who are broken, all who are separated, come, we want you, we want to include you, and when you do choose that, Heaven is going to throw a party. And so Jesus actually gives three parables. We talked about two last week. And now we're going to look at Luke 15, the second half of it, the final parable. And as we do, I want you to think about yourself. And whether you're a parent or not, I want you to think about if you had kids, how would you respond in the situation we're going to read about? Imagine your son or daughter came to you and said, I want to pretend like you're dead. Give me all my money. What would you have responded? And how would you have responded when the son came back begging for a job, begging to be brought back in, even though he squandered everything you gave him? Would you respond as the father did? And also, as we read through this passage, I want you to consider another question as we look at chapter 15, beginning in verse 11. I want you to try to picture yourself in the shoes of the father. But then after that, I want you to consider... If you're not like the father, which son are you more like? Which behavior would you be more likely to portray if this was you in the story? Would you be like the younger son, worried about only what makes you happy, disregarding your family and your culture? Or would you be like the older boy, bitter and saying life isn't fair when the father brings the son back in the community? And so as we read this, try to find the character that you resonate with, what one's most like you, and what that might say about what God is trying to say to you today. So turn with me to Luke chapter 15, beginning in verse 11 through 32, as we put ourselves in the shoes of today's characters. So Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. And so his father divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and then squandered his wealth and wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. And he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating. But no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And yet here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Therefore make me like one of your hired servants. And so he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, and he was filled with compassion for him, and he ran to his son, he threw his arms around him, and he kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son.
father's son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Then bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For the son of mine who is dead and is alive again. He was lost, but now is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. And when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. And so he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has been back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost, and he is found. This is the word of the Lord. So before we really dive into this final parable that Jesus gives about God's search and rescue mission, I want us to take a moment to talk about this Jewish understanding of bet And it's this idea of the house of the father is what it translates to, but it really talks about the entire household, everyone who is under the head of the house. And it's a really important concept for Jewish culture, and it really affects how we understand this story. What it fully encompasses is the social and cultural structure of the Jewish family. Whatever but of a uh, you have heard of referred to how you are seen economically, socially, even religiously. It re- and this, whoever was included in that, it referred to everyone in the care of the father. So it wasn't just father, son, grandkids, whatever. In a wealthy family like the one portrayed in here, it would have, been, it would have included anywhere from 50 to 100 people because it would include the sons, the daughter-in-laws, the son-in-laws, the grandkids, and every servant that worked for the master of the land. And the reason they had these, this understanding of Beta was to provide a structure that protected both the family and the family lineage, so their property and their future. And Jewish law actually had a lot of things laid out to help protect the Beta, to protect the property, to protect the lineage. So that if it was divided in order to keep, in order to provide money, or if you lost, uh, you were in debt or anything like that, there were different laws to still protect the land and keep it in the family. There's also laws on what, when the property was lost or sold, how to make sure the family was still provided for and could survive. And there were even laws on how to make sure the next generation would be able to continue the family's lineage. There's a huge emphasis on family structure, on the household on creating this community together that helped build each other up, strengthen each other, and live together and shared life together. Not only that, but the idea was this kind of hierarchy that provided a structure and order for the household. The oldest male was the father of the household, and his oldest son was the main heir to his lineage. But oftentimes, the younger sons would also get a smaller inheritance. But what it was understood was it didn't matter how the property was divided, who got what, it was understood that the next generation would continue to work the land, continue to work the businesses, continue to take care of what was part of the family, so that they can help protect and carry on the family legacy. And it was expected that everyone within the house of that father would respect the father, would respect the community, and would work to help keep everything intact. And this was just what culture was. It was kind of unheard of for what the son did. It's why when the younger son does what he does, it's so appalling and dramatic and problematic for Jewish culture that it's going to get the audience's attention. It's much more than a lost sheep or a lost coin. This is a loss of the family structure of Jewish culture. This is a loss of how a community is supposed to work. This is a major loss. Not only does the man ditch his family and squander the money that he had on these immoral things, but he weakens the whole family because he loses a third 
of the land and the wealth of that entire 50 to 100 people. He takes away a third of what is keeping that family running, a third of what is bringing in income, a third of what is providing food and shelter and comfort and safety for these people for his own selfish gain. And so with this understanding of family structures and how significant what the son does, and what there's such a strong sense of duty and respect for the family culture, we can better understand why Jesus gave this type of parable. And in this parable, we really actually have two parts. First, we have the younger son of this man. He comes to his father and he says, Hey, Dad, I'm kind of tired of waiting for you to die. Can you just give me my inheritance now so I can do what I please with it? Why don't you give me what's rightfully mine, even though you're not dead, even though you're well and healthy? Let's pretend you're dead. Give me what's mine. Let me do with it what I want. That wouldn't mean anything from your kids, right? Mm-hmm. Wish you were dead, Dad. But yet, the father does what the son asks. He takes the one third of his property that the son was set to inherit, he gives it to him, and as a result, the household is one third weaker. One third poorer. But the father does what the son asks. And so immediately, you know, you think the son would at least be like, alright, I have this, I'm gonna work it, I'm gonna invest it, I'm gonna do something good with it. But instead, he takes the money, he takes what he was given, he takes all his possessions, and he just leaves the family. He goes in search of greener pastures in a foreign country. And not only does he leave his family, but he leaves his culture, he leaves his community, he even leaves his religion and his values and his morals behind, all so he can enjoy the things he thought were better. Of course, immediately he loses everything. He spends all of his money, he loses all of his friends, he has... All the, this wild living, gambling, girls, drunkenness, it all takes it away, and he's left with nothing. And suddenly he finds himself broken, or broke, friendless, and desperate. But he hasn't hit rock bottom yet. It gets worse. The country that he's in, the country where he escaped to to have a better life for himself, is hit with the famine. There's no work, there's no money, there's no food for him, because everyone around him is also desperate to survive. And there's just not enough to go around. And so in his last ditch effort to survive, to make it through, he decides to be hired out as a pig farmer. And if you don't understand Jewish culture, pigs are about one of the most unclean animals that they could have. And to have to work among them was very degrading and would completely make them unclean for, rich, for religious rituals. His job is to basically feed and care for these animals with no pay. And not only does he have no pay, but he also now has no dignity. And so now he is hit rock bottom. He's dirty, he's hungry, he's broke. And he finds himself sitting in a pig pen, wishing he could eat the slop the pigs are eating. I don't know if you've seen movies like Charlotte's Web. The slop does not look appetizing. It's the leftovers, it's the moldy food, it's the scraps. It's not normally fit for human consumption. But he's so desperate, he's so far rock bottom that he would be willing to eat even that. And yet, he can't even have the food the pigs are eating. And so as he's sitting there in the dirt, he's sitting there hungry, he's sitting there desperate and at rock bottom, he starts to think. He begins to daydream of his home, the place he left because he thought the grass was greener on the other side. But as he sits there and he remembers, he thinks, you know, the servants that work for my father, they're treated well. He's kind men, he's fair, they have more than enough food. And he gets his plan. He says, you know, I'm going to go back to my father. And I'm going to beg him to take me back, but not as a son, I know I've lost that right. I know I'm not worthy to be his son, to have those rights and privileges, but I'm going to ask him to take me as one of his servants. He's hoping... He still will be welcomed back into the bet uh, as a lowly servant. Now this is actually a really risky move because the Jewish culture, like I said, has a lot of laws and a lot of rituals and a lot of customs that help provide the structure for the family. And one of the things was the families dealt very harshly with rebellious and disobedient children. So the Jewish culture knew that these rebellious uh, children could be really dangerous for society, dangerous for the families, and so they actually had structures in place so that if a parent had a child that was just so far removed, so far disrespectful, so unwilling to obey, that they were actually told to take their child outside the city gates and stone them. Harsh 
first reality, right? So that's why we have in the fifth commandment, honor your father and mother, so that you can live long in the land. It's a very real possibility. The Jewish law left no room to indulge this kind of evil behavior that the son portrayed. And so what the younger son is risking is if he goes back to his father, he might suffer wrath and punishment for his behavior. However, he is at this point of such extreme desperation, he's starving, and he knows that if he doesn't do something, he's going to die anyway. So he's willing to take the risk. He's willing to go back for a chance at survival. And so the son starts to make the trek home. And I imagine he's kind of rehearsing this speech as he walks along the path. Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your servants. And I imagine as he's walking, he's saying it over and over, you know, practicing the inflection, the pitch, the cadence, so that it best reflects his remorse. And he can express how desperate he is to be brought back into his father's house. So he's walking along, he's rehearsing his speech, he's saying it over and over, and he's not really paying attention to who's coming. But as he's walking along, his father sees him. And like I said, this whole head of household thing has a lot of pride and, and dignity behind it. And so it was really unheard of for the head of the household to greet the guest or family member by going to them. It was always expected that they would come to the father. And it was especially some, not something the father would do is to run to his guest. That would be undignified. That would be a hurt to their pride. It was just not something that was done. Jewish culture would have suggested that when the father saw his son, either he would stand there and wait for the son to approach him or turn his back on him and walk away. But that's not what the father does. He sees his son, this man who broke his heart, who said, Dad, I wish you were dead. He sees him walking along the road. And this father has so much love and compassion for his son, despite what he does, that he takes off at a run to go meet him. He gets rid of his dignity. He gets rid of his pride. And he says, I need to hug my child. And so he comes up, he hugs him, and he kisses him. He doesn't care that his son is dirty. He doesn't care that it's not a smell. He doesn't care that he's ritually unclean because he's been working with pigs. He doesn't really care about any of that. The father is just so excited to have his son home that he cannot help himself from showing his love and compassion. Now, of course, the son is so focused on getting his speech out that and practicing it that he doesn't really even register the actions his father has taken. He doesn't understand that the father is hugging him and kissing him and loving him. He just launches into a speech because he is so ashamed and humiliated. And he says, Father, I've sinned against heaven against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But then he gets to finish the speech he's been practicing along the way because before he can finish and say, make me like one of your servants, his father starts talking to the servants around him and says, hey, no, no. Servants, I need you to take care of my son. I need you to bring him a robe, bring him a ring, get ready to throw a party. Prepare a special meal and call everyone together to celebrate because my son has returned. And it's interesting to remember that this party is going to be full of people who know exactly what happened. There would be no secret as to the fact that their son left out with a third of the wealth. They know the disgrace this son has brought on his family. And on his father specifically, but the father doesn't care. He wants them to come and celebrate that his son has come home. His son was lost, but is found. The son he thought was dead that he'd never see again, he's back, come back to life. And the father is so grateful to have his son back that he doesn't care about the customs or the culture or what the neighbors will think. He just wants to celebrate that his son has been restored to him. And it's during the celebration for the younger son that the second part of our story begins. The older brother comes back from working in the fields and doing all the things a good and respectful child would do. He's doing exactly what Jewish culture said he should do. And as he returns, he sees this big party is underway. And he's like, what's, what's going on? Finds out it's for his wayward brother to come home. 
He's told that his rebellious brother has returned and his father has prepared the best animal they have for a celebration feast. And I don't know about you, but understandably, I get why this angers the older brother. While he's been doing everything right, honoring his father, living in the role he was supposed to, his younger brother went and lost one third of the family's wealth. And he turned his back on everything and everyone that he was supposed to be loyal to. And yet here his father is celebrating the younger son's return and lavishing him with nice things and great food. So the son, older boy is angry. Right? He's like, this is not fair. This is not what is supposed to happen. And so in his anger, he refuses to go in and join the festivities. He is not happy his brother is back. And he doesn't think his brother deserves to have this kind of welcome. And so he remains outside, stewing in the unfairness of it all, becoming more and more bitter. Sounds kind of like that feast parable we talked about, right? Where the people we don't expect are at the table, and the people that should have been are left outside, bitter and in the dark. It's where the sons find themselves. But eventually the father comes out and looks for him, and he begs him to come inside and to celebrate with him. He tries to make him understand why it's so important that the son is back. But the older boy is too upset to obey, and so he lays out in great detail all of the awful things the younger son has done, trying to prove to the father that he shouldn't have forgiven him. Basically, he's asking his father, how could you possibly forgive and overlook just how horrible the younger son has behaved? How could you possibly welcome this sinner back into your house? How could you possibly throw a party? But then he really gets to the heart of why he's upset. He's not so much worried about the fact that his brother is back, or that his father forgave him. He's worried about how unfair it is to him. The son lays out in contrast how loyal and hardworking he has been during the entire time the younger son was off doing his thing. And yet even though he's been this loyal son, this ideal heir, his father never gave him anything, never threw any sort of celebration in his honor, never gave him even a goat to have a feast with his friends. It's not fair treatment, and the older son starts feeling bitter over it. But the father, in all of his patience, reminds his oldest child that even though they're celebrating the return of the younger, <coughs> the older son gets everything that's left. All the land, all the buildings, all the wealth, all the status of the bet of belongs to the older son. And when the time comes and the father does eventually die, everything will go to him. But he says what's most important isn't those things. The earthly possessions are not what's valued here. All the land, all the wealth, all the animals, all the buildings, none of it is important because what's important is the restoration of people. He thought his son was dead, but he finds out he's alive and well. He thought his son was lost from family and from God, and yet he's been returned and restored. He says that deserves to be celebrated. That deserves to be honored. That deserves to be recognized. Yes, he lost his stuff. Yes, everything else is yours, but he is back. And that's how the story ends. It's a kind of a cliffhanger. We don't get to know what the older son did. We don't get to know what his response was. If he went and finally joined in in the celebration, if he, if the two brothers' relationship was restored, or if this older son let his bitterness and resentment turn him away from the very family that he had been loyal to. And it's up to us to kind of determine how we want that story to end, how we think it ends, and how we should respond as a result. So more than just the question of how does the story end or what we think should happen, there are some very significant points that Jesus is trying to make through these three parables, but especially this final one. And the first that he really drives home is that separation leads to humiliation. And what I mean by this is that the younger son chose to separate himself from his family, chose to separate himself from his culture, and to turn his back on his religion. And the only thing that came from separating himself from all of this was that he landed at rock bottom, alone, hungry, and dirty. What Jesus is saying is we are designed to be in relationship, both with others and especially with God. And when we make choices that separate us from those relationships, we 
we turn our back on the community of God's kingdom, then we are going to find ourselves at rock bottom. And it may not look like how the story did. It's possible to be wealthy and well off by worldly standards and still reach a spiritual rock bottom. Ultimately, if we choose to live a life separated from God, if we choose to live for our own kingdom rather than God's kingdom, then we are going to be like those on the outside. Those who are eternally separated from God, left out in the dark and the cold, which is the ultimate humiliation. However, Jesus is saying we don't have to stay separated from God in community. We don't have to live into this humiliation. Just as the younger son finally came to his senses and went back to his father, and he asked forgiveness, he was restored into the family. And we, too, can be brought back into community. Because while separation leads to humiliation, repentance leads to restoration. <clears throat> If we choose to acknowledge that we are not meant to be on our own, that our way of living for ourselves is not what we are ultimately designed to want, and if we turn to God and repent of our selfish ways, God is ready and willing to restore us. It doesn't matter how far we've strayed, how messed up our life is, or how unworthy we may feel. If we humble ourselves, if we repent of our selfishness and our sinful choices, and decide to make a change and live into who God has called us to be, we will find restoration. The younger son did absolutely everything you could think of to live into a sinful and selfish lifestyle. He harmed his family economically and emotionally. He did things that went against God's law and rejected his own cultures and standards. He lived a life completely opposed to who he was called to be, who his father raised him to be. And yet, the Father still forgave him. And how much more does God's love cover over all of our sins, wash away all of our uncleanliness, the moment we choose to return to God and say, I have sinned against you. When we admit that we have messed up, that we cannot be who we are supposed to be on our own, God restores us and shapes us into exactly who we were created to be. Which brings me to my next point. This parable is often called the parable of the prodigal son, meaning the son wasted all of his wealth on lavish and ridiculous things. However, a professor of mine in college pointed out that this really isn't about a prodigal son so much as it is about the prodigal father. See, according to Webster's Dictionary, prodigal means having or giving something on a lavish scale. And the father definitely does that. Right? The son returns, and his immediate response to seeing his son is to run up to him, to give up his pride in such a spectacular fashion that he goes to his dirty, broken, unclean son and kisses and hugs him and, re and ignores all of the awful things the son said and did. He lavishes him with fine clothes and an exquisite meal in this extravagant party, and he calls together all of the people that he's close to and invites them to celebrate in this lavish honor of his son's return. And the restoration of the son to the family. The father's response is prodigal. And just as the father of the story is the true prodigal, God is a prodigal father too. We are sinners, so far separated from God that we put ourselves on the thrones of our own lives. We chose to live in ways that are harmful to others and to God, making choices that break relationships between us and others, and us and God, and making selfish choices. By all accounts, God should look on humanity and the evilness and the sinfulness we are capable of and turn his back on us. Send another flood and be done. We have disrespected and dishonored God so spectacularly that no one could really blame God if he simply washed his hands of us and moved on. And yet, God loves us way too much to let us stay in our sin. He loves us way too much to turn his back on us and reject us for the lives we have chosen to live before him. Instead, he chose to lavish on us the greatest gift of all, Jesus coming down to earth, taking on our sins, dying in our place so that we can be restored and included in God's kingdom. God washes us clean of every sinful, evil, selfish, awful thing we've ever done the minute we repent and turn back to God. 
And the prodigal God embraces us, throws a party and says, celebrate. My child who was lost has been found. You were dead, but now you are alive again. Let's celebrate. But it's not enough for God to be prodigal. The father of our story forgave and restored his son in a spectacular fashion, but the older son wallowed in bitterness at how unfair it all seemed. But the father called to him to embrace his brother, to join in the celebration because the father loved his son so much he was just happy to have him back. He calls his son to respond the same way, to join in the happiness, to love his brother and be glad that he has been restored regardless of everything else he's done. And so similarly, God is calling us to be a prodigal community in light of God's prodigal love for us. When we make the decision to join in God's community, to be restored and to live in who God has called us to be, heaven is going to throw a party. But once we're in the bed of God, once we're part of God's family, we are then called to bring others into the family as well. We are called to love lavishly as God does, to seek for the restoration of all people, and to embrace everyone who turns back to God. We are called to celebrate when someone who is lost is found, regardless of who they are or what they have done. This means that when we go out and share the good news of God's gospel, we don't get to pick and choose who we share it with. If we are truly to love as God loved us, we have to engage in prodigal behavior and reach out to the outcasts, the dirty, the sinners, our enemies, the people society rejects and overlooks. We have to give abundantly and freely to every single person because God loves everyone, and God is calling everyone back into his family. It is our responsibility to be the hands and feet of God's prodigal kingdom, calling everyone to turn back to God, to repent, and to be restored to the bet of God. And as we close, instead of a benediction, I want us to leave with a question for us to consider. I want you to truly ask yourselves, are you going to live as a prodigal son did, living only for yourselves and continuing to break relationship with God and others? Or will you turn back to the prodigal Heavenly Father and repent and be restored to God's family? And then, will you engage in God's mission and be members of God's prodigal kingdom? lavishly sharing the love of God with everyone you encounter. Pray with me. Dear Lord, we are so, so thankful that you are the prodigal father, that you looked at us and you didn't see the sin and the brokenness and the selfishness and just wash your hands of us and say, be gone. But you said, come into my family. Come, enjoy the celebration. Be welcome in. You wanted us to be a part of your family, regardless of who we are and what we've done. You still love us. And you still call us to be restored to you. We are thankful for that. We want to pray today for those who haven't made the decision to come back to you, Lord, that you would work in their hearts to change their mindsets, to want to come and be a part of your family. And for those of us who find ourselves like the older son, a little bitter or angry about some of the people that you want to bring in, that you would help us check our hearts. Help us to realize that you loved us so much that you didn't leave us in our sinfulness, and now it's our chance to help others find restoration too. Change our hearts, Lord, if we are against what you want us to be doing, Lord. We pray that as we come together as a church, that we would be the prodigal church, that we would live out your love to everyone we encounter, whether there's someone society tells us to like or someone society tells us to reject, that you would empower us to love them as you love them, to be your hand and feet for your kingdom and help bring people back into the fold. Be with us today, Lord, as we leave this place, that we wouldn't just leave and say, it was a good service, and go about our day, but that we would be changed by what we've heard today. That we would be empowered and encouraged and excited to go out and love as you love. Let us be 
your prodigal kingdom, Lord. We love you. Amen. Amen. Go in peace.